So I'm just starting the recording now. And at a certain point, Rebecca will be showing us some of her poetry films. And so she'll be sharing her screen. And Rebecca, I think I've set it up so you can share your screen. We'll find that out in a minute or two, won't we? Yes. Um, brilliant, okay. Um, so let me admit Polly and Susan. And if you would like to leave a message for everybody, please can you do so using the chat room at the bottom of the screen. So if you move your mouse down to the bottom, you'll see something saying chat and you can type a message in there and it goes to everyone or it goes to whoever you identify. So that's really good. And I think everybody who is waiting is now in. There we go. So I am now going to mute all of you. And I'm going to ask Rebecca to unmute herself. So there we go. So welcome very much to Palewell's second Zoom meeting. Um, we did one uh, a couple of months ago and it went quite well. And emboldened by that, I'm doing another one. I'll tell you all the technology is not something that this particular poet and publisher is used to. But Palewell Press is very keen to keep going in spite of coronavirus. And this is one way in which we're doing that. So tonight we're going to be hearing from two people who write about nature and the environment, and in Rebecca's case, species extinction, and Michael Tanner is an environmental writer, both nonfiction and fiction and poetry. And he will be reading later. We're going to start with 15 minutes of Rebecca. And before I do that, I would like to tell you a little bit about her. I'm going to read it because she's got so many things that she knows and does. I don't want to miss anything. I met Rebecca at a Cinnamon Press residential where we were both talking, I think, about our prose writing. But sometime later, quite a number of years later, she got in touch and asked if I would remember her and whether I could look at some of her nature poetry. And when I did, I was completely mesmerized and very keen to be her publisher. She lives on Dartmoor in Devon and spends ages every day looking at nature, looking at butterflies and other kind of creatures that live there and writing about them. She has three peevish collections, a sprig of rowan, all the time in the world and a handful of water, two novels and lots of other publications. Rebecca has been a Hawthornden tutor, a Hawthornden fellow, a poetry school tutor, and she won the Coast to Coast to Coast, jointly won the Coast to Coast to Coast pamphlet competition in 2018. She's decided she's going to donate the proceeds of her book to a number of conservation charities, still to be identified, and I can't think of a better use of the money. So, Without more ado, over to you, Rebecca. Thank you very much. Thank you, Camilla, for such a lovely introduction. Um, I'm just so pleased to be a Pale Well Press writer um, because of your wonderful ethos of justice, equality and sustainability, so things I really believe in. And um, I would like to thank you, Camilla, particularly because uh, you took me on when I think you saw about 10 poems and um, so it was great, very trusting of you to take on this project when I had only done 10 and then I changed them all and so it went on. <laughs> so you've been very long suffering and very patient and you've never lost your rag with me. And it was Camilla who designed this amazing cover with a pine martin and a red squirrel in it. Um, both very close to my heart and she also asked Tom Harding to do these beautiful little illustrations that turn up now and then in the book. So thank you to Tom and thank you Camilla. Um, I'm going to start 
by reading you one of the epigraphs, which is from Wendell Berry's Essays. Whether we and our politicians know it or not, nature is party to all our deals and decisions, and she has more votes, a longer memory, and a sterner sense of justice than we do. So I took that as my sort of thoughts, underlying thoughts through, through writing all these poems, and I went on many journeys to find them creatures. So I'll start with the first one in the book, which is actually about beavers. But when you see it in the book, it doesn't say it's about beavers. So Camilla very, another clever thing Camilla did, she very cleverly organised a bestiary at the back. So if you want to know what the creature is about, you can look it up. But if you don't, you could read the poem and make it what you want to make of it. So beavers were released into a Devon River about five years ago and um, to see what would happen to the ecology of the river and now they're waiting to find out if they're going to be a protected species and can stay in the wild and um, a beaver expert from Devon Wildlife Trust took me down to um, the headwaters of this river and because there was a female beaver who had swum 35 kilometers upstream to find herself a safe place where she could build her own lodge and have her kits and that was the second year that she'd had kits the teenagers were still living with her um i don't think i need to tell you anything else anyway it took ages to see her i wanted to just tell you one little thing um, we were sitting there being bitten to death by midges for about an hour or two and waiting for dusk to fall and suddenly there was this incredible gunshot sound and I thought someone was shooting and I thought oh no and then the, it was repeated very soon after and then a huge branch of willow started moving along the other riverbank like um, Burnham Wood coming to Dunsinane and it was the female beaver who'd bitten off a willow branch with two bites and she was taking it to her kits. So this is extinct for 800 years, but in the gathering of waters among gaffling ducks, wind cockling among sallows, sappy cresses and scorpion grass, we jabble and work it, moulding its flow to our needs. We feel currents and eddies in whiskers, in skin webs of feet. We must stop it up, damn it with sticks, saplings, trees, stalks, and with fixings and joints. We halt it, pull it, hold it back. In the quiet of still water, we wrap ourselves, sink ourselves. In the dark of safekeeping, we keep it back, keep it in, keep it quiet, keep it still cold from your language no folk words survive stripped of fur and scent glands now you only catch our tail slap in names of rivers and valleys where still waters are quiet and there's tom harding's little beaver picture curiosity a squall in the branch branches, a dash of sunset with spine splitting teeth and grip scoring claws. A concertina of a creature, like incarnated ferocity, pours itself along pathways of branches and trunk, out to dominions of scent, where nose is a state of being. Nothing escapes needle eyes, ear flick. Every hair of the coat is primed to intuit forecasts of threat and intention with a pelage so deep and sweet they've been skinned many times over before you read the next poem uh, rachel klein says that next time you want to do the a film one of the other films 
you have to select the film and then share the page as opposed to sharing the page and then trying to select the film so i don't know if that makes any sense but it does yeah brilliant thanks rachel thank you um This poem is called Lek. I'm staying in Scotland. Um, this poem is called Lek, and the Lek is the name for the display of the, of the male caper, male kappa k, sorry, kappa kaley. And um, I'm afraid I didn't see one, but I got a feather. Lek. This feather was a gift from a boreal forest tensive as though still attached to the Capacalis body. Tail coverts once interlocked, quivering like a lady's fan. The color of pine forest humus, each one linked with a sprinkle of snow. Imagining this pattern across the tail, I find myself in a woodland clearing, watching the lit fuse of his display, so absorbed he'd be an easy target. His song of knife sharpening mesmerizes me, though I know I should run before he regains consciousness and targets me. He's earned his epithet, goat of the woods. Tears in the barbs are smoothed shut by my fingers, as if stroking could mend breaks beyond hope of repair. And staying in Scotland again, um, Many years ago, probably 40 years ago, uh, a Swedish man released reindeer into the Cairngorms and the Caledonian forest. And they're still there and they're managed by his descendants. In the, in the Arctic Circle, the people, uh, the reindeer herders, um, they have many, many folklore and myths and beliefs. And one of their beliefs is that a pale coloured or a white reindeer calf can choose you and become your spirit animal. And then it will experience what you experience and you will experience what it does. It can even choose to die for you instead when you are in danger. So here is spirit animal. A pale coloured reindeer chooses you to link its faith with yours. It may take a death from you. It circles round before laying itself down in the snowfall of your dreams. You know how far away it is by the waning of the moon. In the dark, you smell it. Hear the grunting and clicks of its feet as it rises to leave you with the bruises where someone has beaten it or with the crunch of lichen in your teeth. And now we're going to Cornwall and where, sorry, not Cornwall, Devon. What am I talking about? Um, a humpback whale arrived in Stark Bay a couple of years ago and it stayed for several weeks. It caused quite a stir locally and I went to look for it at Slapton one day. So here is Fluke. People wander the shore looking to see as though waiting for a god to manifest or a sign of an epiphany, an oracle from the expanse. We stare at the jostle of isosceles triangles playing leapfrog over one another before they collapse on the shingle, sibilant and fricative. Plenty of fish out there. A gulp of cormorant sits poised on what can't keep shape. Their outstretched wings are black witchery of fin. Gannet spiral, strike it like lightning. After a pause, they materialize, almost gagging on their swallow, plunge upwards to free themselves like shooting stars. All water is of a mind to rise. The force of waves pushing up from behind. A boom of a wave detonates, spraying rainbows. 
ground shudders. A snort like a horse. Spouts of white spray as a shining humpback with a dorsal fin arcs through the water, arc after arc, leaving roundels of flat calm in its wake, printing stillness on the higgledy water. Its winged tail lifts before diving beyond our ken, and that's when it seems the air is a hymn, the sea a psalm in counterpoint. Um, staying with the sea, I'd just like to read you this poem about the Atlantic grey seal, but I want to, I'm going to try to share the screen with you, so I hope it works. Can you see that? Can you see that, anybody? Camilla? Yes, we can see the secret life of Steels, the, the poet. Good. Yes, Brilliant. that's what I, I want you to see it because I just thought it would be easier for you to follow it because it's... Mm -hmm. Good idea. I've made, I've made up words in it. Anyway, in the winter, the large colonies of Atlantic grey seals pull themselves out on very sheltered coves and beaches all up the Atlantic coast. And I sat and watched them, a particular one on a cliff, and I'm not allowed to tell you where it is. Um, Cornish Seal Watch will not be very happy with me. Um, and I sat and watched them for a while during last winter. Secret life of seals. It starts with a breath huff, a nose push, a flipper touch, a lean towards, a snuggling, a belly up, a heaving over, a mutual slide along, sloping shingle into warmth of bubble, in twirl skirm, and fangy tango lunge, an almost dozy doe, a flippy tangle, a wrap, a bit of tag, a lot of tug, an ottering, a floating, among breakers, a shorty swing out, a snorty swing out to the deep, a breakneck dash between rocks and knotted currents, diving into invisibility, rising nose to nose, with ox to tingle, with flipper slapping laughter, waltzing with each other's tails, weightless weightless. I should tell you before you go on, everybody is absolutely loving this. Oh, Lots okay. of wonderful comments. Well, so I've I know got, we can't clap. I've got but... so freaked out about the film that I'm, I'm, I'm feeling like a flop. Anyway. No, it's very much um, the opposite. I'll just read one short one and one longer one, um, and then I'll hand over to Michael. Um, this one is one of those poems that uh, you wouldn't necessarily know what it's about, but because I'm here, I can tell you that it's about night jars, and they make a very long migration from Africa to breed here in summer, and they're very hawk-like and they're sometimes called a night hawk and at dusk they make an amazing magical cheering song which goes on for hours and they leave in august uh, and they fly through the night eating moths so that's they leave in august because the moths are over um and i was very lucky i do go out quite a few nights to hear them but one night i went out the bird ringer and he put up a mist net to catch them, which I wasn't quite sure about. But anyway, when he'd weighed it and measured it and ringed this young bird, he let me hold it. And it was just incredible to hold this bird. So I wrote this poem, and you're the only people who'll know what it's about because the other people won't know, ones who haven't come here. 
Um, holding the night. Its body is all feather and bone. I bring it close, wrapping my fingers over its wings. My fingertips answer its bounding heart, as if together they created vibrato. It weighs almost nothing. A ribcage enclosing the inner life, air between wing covers, silks rubbing. With one wrong squeeze, it might shatter into birds. I could fall into the gaping beak, vanish in the pink gullet. Eyes reflect glints of star. The moon has thumbed its wing, its name on wing and tail. Flight is a living thing. Only by being so light can it fly so far and carry the dark. And lastly, I haven't read any of my insect poems, but there are some insects in here because I did cover all the all the animal and creature bird kingdoms. Um, this is Adder. How I came to see it, I don't know, as it didn't move, its head raised slightly from the ground poised as if about to strike, its body looking soft and strokeable. I almost did so, while I stared at it, and it at me, as though we were both caught on the edge of our deaths. Thank you so much everyone for listening, it's been really lovely to read to you, and I'd love to read some more, but I can't now. Um, and. Uh, and now I've lost my nerve about showing you a film, so I might do it later. Um, but anyway, thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Oh, Rebecca, that was fantastic. You shouldn't lose your nerve. People are raving about your stuff. Uh, I'm just going to, before we go on, if Michael will bear with me, um, particularly um, Rachel loves the, the seal words poem. Uh, Frank. McMahon came up with Seely Wonder Winder Flub Slap or something like that. His own <laughs> word because he was so excited by what you were doing. Adam says he particularly liked the snowfall of your dreams. It was wonderful. For me, it's the way you use words and twist them around to make something that really captures what we're looking at. And the phrase that caught my name was sibilant and fricative. Two words I know, but I've never seen them in that way before. So, and I, and also E. Nob said she absolutely loves that feather, the caper Cayley feather. Um, so it's been lovely so far. So please don't lose your nerve. We want to hear more later. Anyway, thank you very much. I'm now going to mute you. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you're unmuted, Michael, that's wonderful. And I'm going to just do a brief introduction to you and then we'll have some of your poetry. So I met Michael at Camden Poetry where he was featuring with the Way Poets and I was struck by his nature poems and how they moved me. And I gave him some contact details at, the point, at that point. And since then he has literally kept me alive right through lockdown with a poem more or less every other day. It was amazing. And um, I kept storing them away and we're just putting the collection to bed, so to speak. Um, I got the e-proof from the printers today, so even Michael hasn't seen that yet. But it's very exciting and I can't wait to see the book. But what I will do is I will hold up a picture of the book cover, this wonderful thing, is uh, a drawing of Dartmoor in pen and ink done by somebody he knows in response to one of his poems. And uh, you'll be hearing that poem later. So Michael says, and he's very proud of this, that he was born in 1933 in Bristol and evacuated at the age of seven with his brothers and sisters uh, to get away from the bombing. But then they brought him back just before uh, the end of the Blitz, so he didn't actually miss very much. 
but he has written a novel called The Fugu Episode, which is about two children who were evacuated. And I recommend that you have a look at that. They went to a, a part of North Cornwall. Um, he did national service in Kenya and then trained as a teacher. And for 38 years, he taught mostly English in secondary schools. And all that time, he's been a keen naturalist and fascinated by language. As well as his poetry and the novel, he's written lots and lots of short stories and he writes serious articles about the environment for the Guildford Environmental Forum. So, Michael, it gives me a great deal of pleasure, finally, to have you read. Over to you. You need to unmute yourself. Michael, I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Can you start well, again, whatever it was? <laughs> I'll start again now, right. Thank that, you. That, thank you very much for your welcome, and thank you very much for your help, and thank you very much for your tolerance, <laughs> particularly on an evening like this when I know nothing at all about these machines I'm looking at, which is not completely true because I have to my left, in my left hand, an iPhone. I never thought I would have one, but my children made it completely clear that I ought to have one. Can everyone hear what I'm saying? Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Um, I never thought that I would use the iPhone for writing poetry. But you see, my writing is illegible these days. So I carry my iPhone everywhere and there are currently about 450 poems on it. It would clog up if I'm not very careful, but it is very useful for me when I'm outside walking and it happens every time I go for a walk, I come back with a poem in my head, or half on the iPhone and half in my head. But fortunately, I don't have to try and read it, my illegible writing, because I can clearly see what it says on that lit screen. Did everybody hear that? Right, good, oh, well done, Rebecca, thank you. <laughs> um, the title of my book is Elemental, and I must make it perfectly clear to any chemists who are listening this evening that I am not a chemist, so I don't want to um, offend you in any ways. It, it has a lot to do with the elements, but from a wider sense. I gather there are about 118 elements, and uh, we, are, we, we are composed of very many of them, but not all of them, and even they don't all exist um, uh, where we can actually find them. That's enough of the chemistry bit. I had a, ga a grandmother who, by her name, appeared to come from Cornwall. Her name was Pasco. So I think a lot of people would agree that sounds Cornish. And I saw her once in my life when she came to our house in Widow's Weeds uh, to uh, stay with my mother for about a week. And that was that. But I made a vow I would go down to Cornwall. And I did. And when I got down there the first time, it was I was doing some national service stuff at the Combined Operations Centre in South Devon, and we had a, an afternoon off, so I thought I'd walk to Cornwall from there, and I got as far as Bude, and then I actually did actually walk a bit further, and got just over the border, and that was that for a very long time. However, I kept my uh, interest in getting there, and I did finally, in about 1965, find myself right down there, and walking along a road which led to <coughs> the highest peak on Bodmin Moor. Uh, um, Camilla, Bodmin Moor, not Dartmoor, because I saw Rebecca looking at me. Uh, it wasn't Dartmoor, it was Bodmin Moor. So I'm much more of an expert on Northwest Dar uh, Bodmin Moor than I am on Dartmoor. Although I have three times cycled across Dartmoor, um, and, I, uh, and I can tell you that that was quite a feat because I was already well over 50. And uh, so you've got some pretty big hills there. So I'm going to start with a poem about my time in Cornwall for the first time. I can find it, I had it here already for me. Here it is. I hope I can see what I'm doing. If I put this little light on, can you still see me? Can you still see me? Yes, good. 
Uh, this one is called Router, and it's about that place. Router. The sign read two miles and a half. I found you infinitely further. Emerging from Bronze Age mists of frontier moors, whose sentinels were momentary first bushes and ghosts of sheep. Even on clear days, when windy sky defines your bastion strength, and buzzards arc above in anchored sweeps, the clambering tourist has a sense of being watched, and his loud car left at your foot seems now a toy, too frail to make a getaway. The high jets weave your skies, rim to horizon rim. Scientists probe your flanks with subtler surgery than their crude ancestors. But you endure to rhythms too vastly slow to move the needles on their clever dials. Night is your element when through the dark of space, cold stones commune with your cold, sorry, cold stars commune with your cold stones and men become mere dreams. That was my introduction to Cornwall, and it um, actually is illustrated on the cover of the book, which Rebecca, uh, which Camilla kindly held up just now, that is actually <laughs> inspired by Router itself, and it's um, an interpretation, obviously it's not a photograph, but Router is there, if you look carefully. Talking about stars, leads me on to another kind of star. And this one was inspired by something across the sea in the other Cornwall. Quite a few of my poems are inspired by the other Cornwall, which is Brittany. Glowworms. Rain after drought has washed the August sky. Stars in their flocks uncountable browse the huge bowl of heaven beyond the tumbling satellites and planes striving to destinations. Their healing reaches to the harvest field, soothing the raked stubble and the little creatures of this little earth. On the moist margins of the road, snails creep skywards. The white campion shows pale, and there, and there, keeping a tryst, you find another miracle, a colony of pulsing gems, wooing their sister stars with constellations of more gentle fire. It's only in these places, you know, I find in, Can in Cornwall and also in Brittany, and not very often in England, can you find, can you see the stars properly? I have seen the stars in the Southern Hemisphere, of course, because I was on the equator for a good 14 months. And that was fantastic and quite frightening, really. The, the multitude of them and the insignificance when you're looking at them is it, it, frightening. And, um, Rebecca will have to check me if I go on too long. Now, going from something which is pretty, because of course glowworms are pretty, but I use the word advisedly, it's a dangerous word to use. I'm going to go to something which is not pretty at all. I'm going to go right on the middle of a moor. And this one is called Wool on the Wire. Up here, sheep feed on wire wool grass, rocks tears, air, they cease not chewing. The bones of their jaws strengthen walls where gates at lower levels sag. From day, their dried out mothers move away to their night of dying, they cease not chewing. Stoic, anonymous philosophers, ingesting all the inventory of shifting light, wanderers, curlew, cloud, reducing all to notions vague as mist, conclusions no more certain than the destinations of their timeless trails weaving them all. That is the nature of the moors as I experience them most of the time. 
Once I was caught in a blizzard wearing a pair of running shorts only, and uh, this was April, and I nearly had it, but I managed to find the ball had broken in places near the bottom, and I got inside the hole, and I survived. I was lucky. I've often been lucky. Now, a creature which inhabits the moors quite a lot, but is not so dramatic as the Capacelli, is the magpie. And the magpies have learnt how to adapt themselves to man. So here's one about magpies. So sure of yourselves in all respects. As meretricious as a glossy mag, black and white page, loud as a demagogue, the most fanatic of parents, with just that touch of blue sky squeezed amid such single-minded contradiction in black and white. I don't know where to fit you, other than in this very place of shove or be shoved off the edge of urban daily life. Your gifts, honed by those centuries of wintry moors with shit and sheep, make you the number one survivor in our obscene and proper seen patch of concrete, plastic shrouded throwaways and witches chemical brews. Good old magpies. I hate them sometimes and I love them. I hate them when they persecute together as they do, they work very well together like men. Uh, a, poor old crow, uh, a poor old pigeon stripping all the feathers off his head so it looks like stick with eyes sticking out of it. I've seen this happen and don't like it. So magpies, magpies, magpies. Like so much in nature, I admire and I sometimes fear it. I nearly stepped, this is true, I nearly stepped once, but well, I did step actually, <laughs> on a sleeping buffalo. I, I was with a little patrol of people running along a track, an earth track, came round a corner, couldn't stop, and my foot was on this buffalo's back. We all ran the other way, didn't look to see what happened. And he, I don't know what he did. I heard his hoops thundering away somewhere in the distance. I don't know, Camilla, how I'm getting on for time. Um, got time for a bit more? Uh, you've got plenty of time, Michael, don't worry. Right. Um, a lot of my observation is through double glazing, and I think I share that with most of you. I've got a very big window at the back of my house, and you, you don't sense the weather when you're inside, but you can see these pretty well. Recently, I've been looking at butterflies through my binoculars, which go on the lavender a few meters from the glass, and they look huge in the binoculars. I thought I had something from the Atlas Mountains out there the other day, but it was only a peacock butterfly, but in the binoculars, it looked huge. Once I saw, well, I see often dragonflies in my garden, but not very often this particular one. This is the uh, one called, well, sorry, this is called the emperor. This one, I'm going to use the Latin word, Anax Imperator. Visitation from Anax Imperator. As you know, they have a pretty long history. I'm not going back to the so-called dragonflies of 318 million years ago because they weren't dragonflies, but they do go back a long way, about the same time as the sharks. On this bright afternoon of our carbon burdened post-industrial age, you quarter my backyard from fence to tidy fence on rigid rustling wings, veined like the skeletons of last year's leaves. What buried stratum unlocked its sorcerer's book, released the imprint of your ghost, which now feeding on daylight and air assumes this dreadful imago. Why have you chosen this uncertain hour? Seeking what prize held in the marvel of your terrible eyes? A dragonfly has 360 degrees of vision, and I can I can't even remember the figure of the facets in its eyes, which are amazing. You can see its prey from quite a long way away, and its prey might be a wasp. I've never seen them carrying a butterfly. I'm pretty sure they do sometimes get them, but they can hold it. I bet those who lived um, a while were there. Similarity uh, creatures who lived so long ago really could get things as well. But their bodies were hardly any bigger than that of the modern dragonfly. They had huge wings up to 18 inches wide. But 
their bodies, but they're not much bigger than the body of the current um, dragonfly. I try not to preach when I write. I live on chalk, and of course, Rebecca lives on granite. And I found my book Elemental was about life in the chalk and life in the granite. And it was originally going to be called Chalk and Granite. Here's a poem from the chalk side, the quiet side. Beyond the hill, there sows a day long surf of countless tires beating an endless road. Tall masts that have no ties to sway them there usurp the bridge. Out of an emptiness, they trawl a ceaseless babel to themselves. But here and now, with misty wing, a south wind strokes the down and sky as pale as clay harbors a voice. Too innocent for clever snares. Against all odds, one tiny lark proclaims faith has been kept with the returning spring. I couldn't really go away from this meeting tonight without reading, if I can find it, uh, this. Because this is a declaration, and I must make it. So forgive me for sounding a little bit imperative. It's called The Voice of Gaia. And he has been a big influence on my life, that gentleman who's still alive down in Devon, James Lovelock. I don't care what people think about his theory. In general, it's correct, I'm sure. Voice of Gaia, you may plant me, cut me down, make your patterns of fields, roads, villages, towns, your horizons of concrete and steel, drain seas, move mountains, send toys into what you call space, like a child who wants to find out. But I am the process. From way beyond your biosphere, to depth of magma, depth of your sun. Call me what you will. I am the process. And we all, fungus, ant, whale, protozoa, butterfly, and even you, the so-called articulate one, are part of the whole, present, promoting or paddling it up as you think you desire. So young in your thoughts as in your time, in this place you call world, and such a tra strange sense of what you call beautiful, and what you call wrong, what you call right. But putting your labels on things will not make what you call life, not make what you call death, those palisades you love to build. How am I doing for time there? I think maybe one more, if you can manage that. Can I, 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 I want to talk about something else. I see often through my window because they did and grow shed in my garden. Ah, <laughs> no, it's not wolverines or <laughs> squirrels. This one is called Moment of Fox. And a lot of my poetry does depend on encounters. Moment of Fox. When sometimes you pause in your easy gait, between here and there, and give the house a long considering stare, I behind glass watch with a quickening heart, trying to catch before you part the essence of your being, knowing I never shall. You are elusive as cloud shadow passing over wheat, yet wise enough to recognize how like yours, a human heart, maybe. Well, I've got <laughs> masses more to be, as you know. I always have masses more, but I think my time is out. <laughs> I think for the moment that would be fantastic because I'd like to have some uh, an opportunity just to thank everybody for coming. And um, as you know, we're hoping to have another poem from each of you at the end of the, the meeting. Uh, one or two people have to go 
but I know that uh, we're recording this and the recording will be online shortly. So you'll be able to catch up with anything that you miss at the end of this. But uh, there are lots of people still watching. I think something like 39 or 40 people. So I just wanted to say the books that you've heard about tonight will be available from us. You can order them. And I recommend that you do because both poets speak to me about nature in ways that I hadn't thought about before. And I find that really good. Rebecca, do you want to have another shot at one of your films, perhaps the In Star one? Okay, here, Rebecca. Um, okay. I'll try not to mess this up. I've got a different method. So, um, Thank you, Susan Jordan. <laughs> Thank you, Jackie. Can you see this? Can you see this? Not yet. I don't know why it's gone wrong. So basically, I think your friend Rachel said, if you <coughs> start the film and then share your screen. If it doesn't work, don't worry. It's just, it would be lovely. It would. It's my best film. Mm -hmm. um, In Star. I stumble over islands of tussocks, among bog squelch and gurgle, a clatter of stream nearby, tricklings from. But to see butterflies, I need a butterfly vision. Switch focus from what's below, look further across a small immensity, over reeds and willows, to blue buttons, dropwort. Ragged Robin, where flight conjures itself, rising and dipping, or was it a flicker of light? And whatever it might be, I flounder towards, until there it is. Smaller than I remember, a gasp in my throat. This phase is the briefest, the longest being the team of black larvae inside a spun web, fattening on devil's bit scabious, when wings like light through stained glass weren't even a dream. Mm. Fantastic. We got there. Thank heavens you saw it. Yes, <laughs> and it's gorgeous. Well, that's wonderful. Um, so I think what I'd like to do is to ask Michael to read one more poem and then Rebecca, if that's okay. Michael, are you ready? Uh, need to yep. Mute. Unmute. I'm trying to unmute him. Michael, you're muted. Yeah. Can That's you hear better. me? Yes. Right. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes, you can hear me. Put your hand up. Can you hear me, Rebecca? Good. Yes. Um, this one is not in England. It's not in Brittany. It's a long way away. And it's... It, it does one of the functions of poetry, I hope. 
it fantasizes a little bit. Silver birches outside Moscow. Caught by an early snow along the forest edge, these silver birches stand in frozen pirouettes, unpartnered ballerinas on a barren stage against a backdrop of dark firs. The flaking tatters of their bark, seamlessly spun, catch dawn's brief dye. Perhaps this fall will melt today, and under restless stars, they will resume their dance before real winter comes. Then sleep the sleep only trees know throughout the dreadful tyranny of snow. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you. That's marvellous. Beautiful. Yeah. All right. So, um, so Helen, I'm going to put you on mute, if I may. Perhaps you can put yourself on mute. Uh, me, you mean? I, I can, yes. I'm on mute at the moment. Okay. Um, Marvellous, Michael. Thank you. Um, Rebecca, could we have one more poem from you? Oh, you need Can't to unmute as well. Yeah. That's it. Rebecca? Yes. Can you, I'm going to share, I'm going to share a screen with you again. Mm -hmm. So can you see this? <coughs> That's worked, has it? Well, we can yes. see oh, it's one of your poems. Yes. Lovely. Yes. Blackwater. Okay. I, I'm showing it to you because I've done the same thing again. I haven't done it all the way through the book, by the way. But I thought I'd read this one because it's a bit like the seals one, which people seem to like a bit. Um, and this is about water bowls who are very difficult to find. And I saw one um, for about 10 seconds, I, uh, which allowed, gave me permission to uh, write about it. So here's backwater. Among reflections, refractions of stalks, stone shine, water wink, rain sure, where tree trunks wiggle, Shivery leaves blur, their noses lead ripple trails. Along muddy edges, in squidge, they gnaw out hallways to guard with bicker and toothy cuffs. Where shadows that move spell danger, they flop plip in a chorus of vanishing splishes, dribbling to weightlessness of sub aqua mud clouds. They sink in a blink, beside or below, inside out or back to front. They burrow and frisker in what they embody. Water love, water soul. Mm, fantastic. Ah, oh, what a lovely reading. Well, I just really would like to thank both poets very, very much for coming on and for being published by me. I feel terribly proud and urge you all to look out for their books and look out for all the things that they produce. And Rebecca, I know that you share some of these beautiful films online where people can click a link and watch them as well. But uh, yes, I, I think you've got several films that we're going to be sharing. Oh, okay. But uh, no, that's fantastic. And thank you all very, very much for coming. It's just going on for eight o'clock and I really do appreciate people's time. A video recording of the whole event is likely to be online very soon, unless I mess it up. This new technology does take some getting used to, but in the meantime, to have this many people involved is a wonderful feeling. And I wish you well. I want you to all stay safe and well and keep creating. There are lots and lots of people that like Frank and Chaucer and Adam and so on, whom I know as writers. And um, I just had a lovely evening. Thank you all very, very much. Bye-bye.
So I tell you what, why don't we unmute everybody, if we can, or unmute yourselves, and uh, then we can have some proper clapping. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Brilliant. Well done, everybody. Well done, Dad. Hi. Bye. Bye. Thank you for coming. Wonderful. Okay. Lovely. Gorgeous. There we go.